In this video I want to lay out the case for why ideology does not really matter half as much as everybody thinks it does. Vilfredo Pareto wrote a very long and complex book in 1916 called The Mind and Society, which contains the bulk of his contributions to what is called elite theory today. If you'd like to know more about that in detail, I'd recommend taking my course, Foundations of Politics, and picking up the textbook for that course, The Populist Illusion. Here I am going to try to keep things super simple and focus on just one of Pareto's ideas, that most of our written laws, and before that our ideas, are post hoc rationalisations of what he calls sentiments. We might just say instincts. Human behaviour is fundamentally non-logical, Yet, there is a deep-seated human need to appear rational. Thus, humans act and then generate arguments to justify those actions after the fact. This idea was lent a lot of weight by empirical research almost a century after Pareto was writing, which is summarised in popular books such as Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow and Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind. However, where researchers such as Kahneman and Haidt draw these conclusions at the level of individual decision-making, Pareto is talking about society-wide decisions as embodied in the actions of those in power, also known as the elites. When it comes to power, there are only really two arguments. For the sake of simplicity, let me summarise the first as follows. BS, 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 therefore we should rule. This argument we can call, following another elite theorist, Gayantano Mosca, the political formula of any regime. However, for practical purposes in the running of things, those in power need a second argument. BS, 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 therefore we were correct to follow our course of action. Now since for Pareto societies are defined entirely by their elites, all other arguments besides those made by power in the service of their own power are essentially noise. Note that both these arguments take place after a group is already in power and after that group has already acted. The action comes first and the argument follows in both cases. Why should you be king, Charlemagne? Is it because you crushed all your rivals with sword and lance? Uh, no, it's because I was sent by God. Oh, oh OK, then. God save the king. Henry, uh, why should you be the head of the church then and not the pope? Uh, is, is it because you wanted uh, Mary Anne Boleyn or something like that? Oh no, it's because I was sent by God. I don't know, go and read Martin Luther or something. Just go away. So, uh, Vladimir, aren't you basically an autocratic dictator? What happened to the rule by the workers? Uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat is vested in me and this is a necessary phase in order to get to true communism or something. Also, we need to hire some managers because workers don't know what they're doing. Okay, enough questions. Go directly to Gulag. Hey, Tone, why are all our leaders just versions of you glorified managers then? Um, the future is inevitable and you can either be on the right side of it or get left behind. Let's not waste time with politics and just get on with what needs to be done. Oh, all right then. God save the king. You can have hours of fun doing your own version of this. But in the end, you'll see that every argument either has the form... BS, 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 therefore we should rule, or BS, 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 therefore we were correct to follow our course of action. Now those of you of a more ideological bent might be screaming at your monitors. You might be saying things like, the BS matters, AA, the BS matters, which is to say that the content of the BS has a real effect on the world. And this is true. But the content of the BS is generated entirely by the question of which group is in power. The divine right of kings means, in the end, that whatever Charlemagne or King Henry here says, goes. 
Likewise, communism was, in the final analysis, whatever Lenin or later Stalin said it was. And, by exactly the same token, liberal democracy is whatever Tony Blair and his friends decided it is on any given news cycle. Things they want are liberal democracy, and things they don't want are a threat to democracy. This is the true nature of power. What any ruling class wants will be driven primarily by the maintenance and expansion of their own power. Thus, when the managerial class invent invisible enemies like racism or sexism or terror or climate change or COVID-19 or whatever else, the net effect is always expansion of managerial control. When James I of England, also known as James VI of Scotland, wrote his The True Law of Free Monarchy, he argued, surprise, surprise, that there should be basically no checks on his power. In a sense, James was more honest than most leaders who try to dress up their post hoc justifications for power with legalism. Such was the case with William of Orange, who invaded England in 1688, a foreign power, mind you, and then reached for the nearest copy of John Locke's works to justify his rule. If the other side had won, they'd have likely reached for James I's old books, which, in fact, James II did do when he was the king, uh, or maybe he'd have reached for Robert Filmer or Thomas Hobbes or whatever else. But William of Orange did not invade England because he was a staunch Lockean, or for any ideological reasons at all. He did it because he sought a geostrategic position against the French, and, well, because he could. He simply had the power to, especially because James II had a good number of enemies at home. But whether they reached for their Robert Filmer or for their John Locke, both sides in the struggle of the Glorious Revolution had the same argument. BSBS, BSBS, BS, BS, therefore we should rule. William of Orange, signing the Bill of Rights in 1689 was simply the formalisation of the fact that power would be handed to the parliamentarians who backed him, granting MPs such rights as parliamentary privilege or what Herbert Spencer would later call accurately the divine right of parliaments. In a recent Substack article called Ideas Have Consequences, Mike from Imperium Press, which published my best-selling book, The Populist Illusion, buy it now, recognised this fact that I've been talking about by pointing out some cold, hard truths to people who don't want to hear it. It's worth quoting him at length. There's a view implicit in much modern thought that we could call the Hesiodic view of history, that ideas start out pure and only later become corrupted. Often this view is applied to things that are quasi-religious. The Enlightenment, in the eyes of Steven Pinker, was a miraculous, sui generis event that issued from we know not where, because the price of liberty is eternal vigilance or something. We just kind of forgot how to be liberal, and now the horizon is darkened by the looming spectres of communism and fascism. Apart from the fact that any idea whose price is eternal vigilance is weak and unnatural, this view is contradicted at every step by the actual history of ideas. Religions, ideologies, movements, value systems, these don't always or even usually start out pure and become corrupted over time. Ideologies start out beholden, to circumstances, and as those circumstances change, the ideology either adapts itself to those circumstances or it dies. In fact, most of the time, we see the precise opposite of the Hesiodic view. Ideologies very often start out as malleable and heterogeneous, then rid themselves of their impure elements and become more fixed and internally coherent over time. 
as the ideology consolidates power, it gains influence over just those circumstances to which it was beholden. It can increasingly influence those circumstances more than it is influenced by them. The early NSDAP, which is to say the German National Socialists or the Nazis in the vernacular, with membership not much over 50, was not in a position to influence much of anything. And at this early stage, its ideas were very much in flux. These few dozen men, meeting in a beer hall, had a worldview much less settled than did the fully consolidated Reich, with its strict command structure, party offices, parliamentary groups and media apparatus. National Socialism was a, ver- was a worldview in the process of development, a process which was not yet worked out at the time of its destruction, to say nothing of its infancy. So if we are to look for authentic National Socialist orthodoxy, we must look primarily to the post-consolidation era. If the worry is that power struggles contaminate ideological purity, look to the shape of the ideology when the struggles were more or less over. Had Germany won the war, you would have seen yet more consistent and purist National Socialism, just as you did with liberal democracy. Liberalism was never more liberal than when all its enemies had been destroyed at the end of history. This is troubling to the likes of Jordan Peterson and Steven Pinker, who try to draw a line between embryonic liberalism and mature liberalism. But this is simply not tenable. This is not a historical rule. Sometimes revolution does sunder the father from the son, as happened in the classical world vis-a-vis the archaic world. But in the case of National Socialism and contemporary liberalism, there can be no question. The end was the fulfilment and not the rejection of the beginning. Now, another way of saying all this is that no ideology survives contact with reality for long, unaltered, and will only fully realise itself in practice rather than in theory. When Benito Mussolini marched on Rome in 1922, he did not lay out the principles of fascism from A to Z. In fact, the true shape of fascism would not be formalised for several years after he took power. He said only, and I quote, Our programme is simple. We want to rule Italy. Now say what you want about Mussolini, but like James I, he was more honest than most leaders. This is one of several reasons behind why I have focused on what I have called the negative vision, or clear them out, that I have on perfecting so-called ideology, which in the end does not matter in the slightest, since it is downstream of power. The real and ultimate question concerns who is in power, which people and which groups, not how they justify their rule or their actions. If the current elites were replaced by us or by people like us, all else would flow from there. We would post hoc justify our rule and our actions in the same way as all other regimes throughout history have done. But by the very virtue of being different and a different set of people from those who currently rule, We would do different things and come up with different BS for why. I appreciate that this is a difficult thing to accept. How can ideology simply not matter? It seems so counterintuitive. And people who have an ideology to sell, be it white nationalism or third positionism or orthodox Christianity or, you know, fifth dimensional uh, recreated paganism or whatever else will tell you to reject what I am saying because their BS matters more than the observed reality of power to them. They will make moralistic and idealistic arguments about the motives of those who seek power, which can be summed up with a single word, cope. Let me give an example. I will not embarrass the author by naming him because he is young and might one day learn to accept reality as it is, rather than how he dreams it ought to be in a world that has never existed. He says, Why do you 
want what you want, though? Why does anyone want what they want? Are the reins of power solely going to be in the hands of sociopathic narcissists who like to coerce to get what they want? Or are the elite theorists themselves just projecting their own sociopathic narcissism onto the concept of power and perceive it purely as a means to obtain golden glory? The very idea of power being solely in the hands of the few leaves out an important part of why for obtaining power, which puts this theory in a tizzy. If your why is selfish, your reign of power will be hellish. Now, first off, ignore the definition of the iron law of oligarchy given. This is plainly someone who has not studied Robert Michel's. And again, I encourage you to take Foundations of Politics and to read The Populist Delusion for a more accurate understanding of what the iron law of oligarchy actually is. But second, and much more importantly, this author is doing his best to deny the fact of what Nietzsche called will to power. Let us return to the quotation by Mussolini. He said, Our programme is simple. We wish to govern Italy. They ask us for programmes, but there are already too many. It is not programmes that are wanting for the salvation of Italy, but men and willpower. He needed no other arguments than the current leaders are bad and Italy needs saving. We are the men to do it. This is the will to power. No one seeks transformational power, which is to say one that affects a true circulation of elites, for selfish reasons. By definition, selfish careerists will follow the status quo and not seek its overthrow. People like Wormtongue, for example, would never take a stand like Benito Mussolini did. The iron law of oligarchy is such that seeking reform within the system as it stands, that is, without enacting a circulation of the elites, will result not in you changing the system, but in the system changing you. I'll repeat, you will not change the system, the system will change you. That's the iron law of oligarchy. This is precisely why Robert Michels, the man who coined this idea, ended up supporting a man like Mussolini and not the Liberal Union or any of the other establishment parties in Italy at that time. Now, none of this is to say that ideology does not matter at all. Of course, it does shape the world around us. But rather to point out that it is always downstream of power and its interests. So that unless your ideology happens to align with those interests, it will not be selected by power. Unless, that is, you become the power. But in that case, as I have already said, your ideology will not survive contact with reality for long anyway. It will turn into something else, as fascism was quite different in, let's say, 1930 than it was in 1922. So saying that ideology shapes the world around you simply says, if you want to take it down to ultimate causes, power shapes the world around us. Liberal democracy in the 19th century meant free trade and voluntary association and the spirit of laissez-faire. But this was only because free trade suited the British Empire. Britain was the first shipping nation, the leading industrial economy, the supreme naval power and the largest colonial network. Advocacy for free trade in Britain was little more than a disguised request for free commercial enterprise to the whole world, including territories controlled by their rivals. Classical liberalism was the post hoc justification for all of this. In fact, the British Empire was straightforwardly mercantilist and protectionist until at least about 1846. The repeal of the Corn Laws represented the final defeat of the old landed aristocracy who represented rural and agricultural Britain. 
The period of laissez-faire effectively ended by about 1890, when it was no longer politically expedient to support it. The British Empire was run by industrialists, principally for industrialists, and so liberal democracy reflected this. When managerialism took root, the USA, which had taken over as world hegemon by that point, was run by managers, principally for managers, and so liberal democracy reflected this. Managerialism loves the invisible war, as I've already alluded to. The war on poverty, the war on crime, the war on drugs, the war on terror, the war on COVID-19, the war on racism, the war on sexism, the war on homophobia, the war on transphobia, the war on climate change, and so on and so forth ad nauseum. It does it because each ratchet enlarges the scope of its power and its control. Liberal democracy will be this until it is no longer politically expedient for it to be so, and then it will become something else again, or else until those in power decide to dispense with liberal democracy altogether, in which case we will have true circulation of elites, as I've alluded to. Hopefully, this has given people some things to think about. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. If you like what I do here, pick up a course at the Academic Agency, like and subscribe, join the channel, pick up a mug. But most importantly of all, get out.